a few more minutes to join us, two more minutes to join before we start. We're getting to a time of worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come and reveal yourself. William, find the song, Holy Spirit, that we welcome in this place by Benny Hinn. We give you praise. We give you glory. We adore you. We magnify your name. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes. That comes second. Thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. Raise the volume. Can you just lift the hands and bless the Lord tonight? We bless you, Jesus. Your presence is in our midst tonight. We raise you high, oh God. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Not like you, Jesus. Now on to the, the land upon from the throne, we the raise the song. We, we raise the song. Hey. For you are God and God, God alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We raise for you a God, you a God, for you a God, and God. God. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your voice and shout it. Oh! 
Praise the Lord. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study tonight. I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Chima Noram, all the way from uh, um, out of state. From where? <laughs> Elizabeth Town, Kentucky. Elizabeth Town, Kentucky. Amen. Dr. Chima, it's all yours. Okay. Amen. Can everybody hear me well? Can everybody hear? Yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay. Yes, so, Pastor, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so once we start, um, if you have any questions as we go along, um, I'm going to make it a little bit interactive. So if I ask a question, Type the answer into the text box. Can all of us see the chat box? If you see that, just type it in there uh, and let's make it uh, a little bit interactive since this is supposed to be a class and uh, not just, uh, you know, a, a preaching session. Okay, so um, <clears throat> it's so wonderful always to be able to, to teach uh, Bible school. Uh, I also do this uh, here in the church. Uh, I help them out with some of their topics, so. Uh, it's something I always enjoy doing. Um, uh, one of the one one aspect of the Great Commission is not just preaching the gospel, but uh, Jesus also said that uh, we should go and teach all nations. So uh, the Great Commission is not only preaching, you know, to sinners. It also has to do with equipping the church to do the work of the ministry. So it's always a joy to be able to teach and uh, equip people so that they can know how to be effective witnesses and just know what is in the scriptures. So we're going to be talking about the person in this section. We're supposed to be talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's just amazing. I just honor uh, uh, Pastor uh, and Apostle Chu and uh, want to thank God for even the music background he played on, uh, you know, Benny Hain and Catherine Kuhlman. All these people or these evangelists were... Uh, especially Kathy Kuma, was actually one of the women God used mightily 
to steward, uh, to restore that ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, back to the church for us just to uh, be conscious of his personality and to realize that without the person of the Holy Spirit, there's no real ministry. There's no true ministry that will look like Christ. And every man and woman who is on the church front or making waves today, impact, if you listen to them closely, you realize that each one of them um, has a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's quite obvious today that um, based on the scriptures, uh, the last revival is supposed to come out of the dark continent of what we call Africa. And that's what's happening now. Even the, most of the music ministers and everything, there's just that revival birthing out of Africa. And um, it's amazing as you see many of these men, they always talk about the Holy Spirit and their relationship with the Holy Spirit. So um, it's important if you're going to be an effective ministry, this aspect, you have to understand it is important. We cannot do ministry without recognizing the person uh, and, uh, Jesus sent to help us to continue his ministry here on earth. So in this section or in this model, we're going to be talking about the who is the Holy Spirit, uh, because if we're going to be effective operating in his gifts or his ministry, we must know who he is, okay, based on the scriptures. The next thing we were going to look at is his person. We have to understand him as a person. That's the only reason why it's possible to have fellowship with him. Uh, and the next thing we're going to look at evidences of his personality. So if I ask, for instance, if I were to ask you, you know, who is so-so-and-so person, you would describe the person as being loud or being tall or being quiet or whatever description. So we're going to look at, based on the scripture, some of the things, the personality. Because if you understand um, a personality of somebody, then it helps you to have fellowship with the person. For instance, if you have a friend and you know that he, he's quiet, he doesn't like noise, you know, uh, but and you choose to be noisy and all that, then you're you're not your relationship is going to have a lot of hindrances. So if we can understand his personality based on the scripture, it will help us to really have fellowship. Okay, then we're going to look at some of the characteristics of his personality, and then we'll be looking at the symbols of the Holy Spirit. Um, and um, when we talk about symbols, we're not trying to say the Holy Spirit is a symbol or anything, but these are things that explain that will help us understand more uh, with whom we are. <clears throat> we are dealing with. Okay, so let's move on. I have very few slides, but I have a lot of notes in between them. So I will just uh, uh, be going step by step. So we're gonna start with John 15, 26. If they can help us put that on the background. John 15, 16. John 15, 26. 26. I probably need to, just so I can see when it shows up. Whose screen is it going to be on? Uh, is it going to be behind you, Pastor Chu? On the yes. screen behind you, is that where I'm going to see it? Yes. Okay. I want to make sure I know when it comes, when it pops up. I will go ahead and open my Bible to see where we are. Do we have it up yet? Not yet? So I believe all of you have your Bibles. So you go ahead, open while we're still waiting for them to put it on, on the screen. I'm going to go back to my slide presentation. And uh, Okay, so John 15, 26. I'm going to go ahead and read. It says, <clears throat> this was Jesus speaking. He says, but when the, the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Okay, so the first thing about the Holy Spirit that we must understand is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Uh, there are several uh, um, scriptures that call him like Acts 1-4, if you want to put that up. Acts 1-4, he's called the promise of the Father. There are several scriptures where the Holy Spirit is called the promise of the Father. So it's important to understand from whom the Holy Spirit is coming. So he is proceeding from the Father. And... Um, 
back in church church history is what we call the Nicene Creed. And there was a division in the church because uh, there was a part of the church that said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and from the Son. And so that was a little bit of confusion because the issue is that if you say it proceeds from the Father and from the Son, that means uh, there is no real leadership in the Godhead because we know by scripture, the Father is leader, is the leader, is the uh, leader of the Godhead. And so um, it was, uh, there was a lot of contention just over that statement. And then finally, you know, the, the church actually split just on that when they decided to make that statement, that the, the to, to agree with the statement based on scripture, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Uh, so he comes from the Father, but he comes through the Son. So we do not receive anything that uh, anything that comes from uh, uh, from God has to come through the Son. Okay, so Jesus is basically the administrator. So he is the one actually that gives out. Um, the best example I would use to describe is maybe the story of Joseph. If you remember when there was corn in Egypt, um, all the corn in the land actually probably belonged to Pharaoh. But Joshua, jo Joseph was the administrator. So he was in charge, if you remember. He was the one that was distributing corn. And anybody who wanted corn would have to come to Joseph and he would, you know, inspect and ask them questions and things like that. And that was how, of course, he met his brethren, if you go back to that story. So in that same context, uh, Jesus is similar at the right hand of the Father, or at the right hand of Pharaoh, if you want to use that language, as the administrator. So we do not receive anything that Jesus did not receive. And that was why Jesus was also filled with the Holy Spirit and operated in the gifts because anything he received, we can receive. Okay, so we don't receive anything outside of Christ. So it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father because he's the gift of the Father, but he comes through the Son. Okay? Um, so the Holy Spirit was sent, through, was sent by Jesus after his ascension. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming, one of the main things is to continue the ministry of Jesus through the church. Okay, and so anytime, I've said this time and time, anytime you see um, any church that downplays the person of the Holy Spirit, ignores the person of the Holy Spirit, or, you know, some people believe but never allow him to function, they are going to find it almost, it's almost impossible to continue the ministry of Jesus. And so that's why the, a lot of churches today um, are finding it difficult to continue that ministry because the Spirit of God is the only one who helps us to continue the ministry of, of Jesus. Let me move my text box away so that I can see. Um, it's important to understand that we are in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, okay, which is actually the church age. So the Holy Spirit is functioning today on earth through the church, okay? Uh, we've had the dispensation in, in the earlier dispensation. The Father was dealing with Israel, okay? We had a short 33 years, if you may say that, of the dispensation of the Son where Jesus Christ came to die, and now we have we are in the church age, okay? Um, the Bible says that the church age will continue until the fullness of the times of the Gentiles. That's in Romans 11, 25. So at the end of the fullness of the times of Gentiles, then uh, that means that most of the Gentiles would have been either they've heard the gospel or have been received into the kingdom, okay? And then God will turn his attention back to the nation of Israel. Gentiles will still be saved, but... Uh, it will not be as much as it is now. And that's when Jesus Christ will come on earth to start this dispensation of the sun, which is for a thousand years, okay, after the, what we call the tribulation. Okay, so it's important to understand all the scriptures. So this is the time of the Holy Spirit, and this is the time of the church. So this is the time that why we have to be effective, we have to do the work of, of the ministry. And um, the reason why Jesus Christ has to still come and uh, fulfill his own dispensation is because of uh, Jesus is called the second Adam. Um, the first Adam failed. And if you remember, he died at about 900 and I can't remember exactly 930 years. Or so so he never fulfilled his thousand years. So Jesus is coming on earth to reign for a thousand years after the, the church or the Holy Spirit's dispensation. Okay. Now, one of the most important things is to understand that the uh, Holy Spirit is also the third person in terms of dispensation, okay? So we are in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. First uh, John 5, 7, and 8. We can put that up. First John 5, 7, and 8. First John 
5. And we're going to read from the King James, okay? Because this is one of those scriptures that um, if you don't see it in your Bible, you may have to check the bottom, okay? So if it's not in your Bible, you check the bottom, which simply means this scripture is in the, uh, it's in some of the original scriptures, but it's not in some of the, 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 the scripts. So you're going to see a uh, quotation at the bottom of your Bible if you don't see it in there. Okay, it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are, and these three are one. Uh, Amen. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is uh, third in dispensation in terms of, we said this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So with the first dispensation was the Father dealing with Israel. Jesus Christ came, came for a short, short, uh, space of time for about 33 years. That was the dispensation of the Son, and which will continue for a thousand years after this, this dispensation. But the, the third person, we often call him the third person uh, in the Trinity. Okay? So the Father basically is the head of the, of the Trinity. Okay? Um, Jesus Christ is, even though they are co-equal, equal in the sense that they all are um, God. Okay? Um, the best line, the best way I can, I, I often use this to ex explain, is uh, like a father and his wife in the term, in context of marriage. That the husband and the wife are equal, but however, in the context of marriage, the the husband is the head of the wife. Okay, and that's the why the Bible says in the same context that the father is the head of Jesus, who is the head of the wife. That's just his bride, the church. Okay, so in the same context, the father is the head of the Godhead. Jesus Christ is uh, is is second in, in command, if you may want to use that language, and the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, uh, and that's what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit uh, will glorify Jesus. So the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus, and Jesus always points to the Father, and then the Father always, you know, will send the Spirit and always glorifies the Son. So there's just like a circle of activities that occur in the Godhead. So it's important to understand uh, this. So the Holy Spirit is the third person in dispensation, he is God, okay? So he's not a, a smaller God. He is God, okay? It's just like, um, let's uh, the best example I've always used is like a family, okay? You have a father, you have the son, uh, maybe you have a, 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 the wife, and then maybe they have a, a, a dog in the house. You understand me? Uh, the dog, you cannot say the dog is, is, even though he's in the family, he's not of, he's not human. You understand? Uh huh. So the Holy Spirit is not like a smaller God or whatever. He still has the same God nature, you see. So the Father, the Son, and all the children, all of them are superior to any animal you bring in the house, no matter how much you love the animal. And so in that, I'm just trying to explain that in that same context, the, 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 the Holy Spirit is God. You know what I mean? He's, 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 he is um, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. So all persons in the Godhead have those characteristics, you see. So uh, when Jesus was on earth during his earthly ministry, he was not omniscient. Uh, he, he was not. Uh, he was not. Um, he was not omnipresent. He was limited in a human body. Okay, but today Jesus Christ is omnipresent. You understand me? So uh, the Bible says he has. When the Bible described him in the book of Revelation, uh, let's see. What did I write here? First, yeah. When the, when the Bible described him in the book of Revelation, it described him as having. As this, as having seven eyes, Amen. Just give me a minute. Let me. Uh, give me a minute. Let me open up. Somebody was uh, trying to reach out to me. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, let's go on. Uh, someone said, "Can you share? Is my screen not the PowerPoint is no longer showing?" Okay. 
you have to project it back over there. I have to project it. It's not projecting. Oh, let me see. Let's see. Uh, is it projecting now? No. Uh, what do I have to do? Do I have to share my screen or something? Uh, Click on share screen at the bottom where it says share screen in green. Oh, hold on. So I was doing that. And if you're looking at two monitors, pick the monitor you're sharing. Okay, hold on. Okay, let's see. Uh, let me come out and open up. Let's see, share screen. Sure. Can we see now? Yes. Yes. So we're on this. We're on this page. Yeah, we're seeing, yes. Yep. Okay, good. So we're talking about the saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And then we're also talking about the Holy Spirit. So let me switch to my screen uh presenter's view so i can see my notes okay you guys can still see it yes okay let's move this out of the way yeah okay so we we're talking about the holy spirit being the third person in dispensation we're just going to talk about the godhead and how each person in the godhead is both omnipresent omnipotent omniscient okay when jesus was on earth during that space of time he was not omnipresent obviously he was in a human body uh, but when you look at the book of Revelations today, the Bible describes him as having seven eyes. And the Bible says these are the seven spirits that go to and through the earth. And so uh, today, um, it's important to know that Jesus is omni, omnipresent. And uh, remember when, uh, when uh, what was his name? Thomas, you know, opened his mouth and said, oh, you know, if, I won't believe until I put my hands in his side and all that stuff. And then, you know, after about a week, Jesus shows up and says, you know, someone's come and put your hands. So Jesus actually heard him when he was saying all that stuff, you know. So today Jesus is both omniscient, omnipresent. He holds all the qualities and the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, each person in the Godhead holds all the qualities of God. Okay. <clears throat> so we said this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit and this is the church age. Um, so the Holy Spirit is here to continue the work of the ministry of Jesus through the church. Okay. And the last scripture we looked at was Romans eleven twenty five, 25, that talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. So it's important to understand that, that he's here to continue the ministry of uh, Christ through the church. Okay. So do not say, oh, I don't need to preach. The Holy Spirit is going to go and do it. No, the Holy Spirit is not going to preach. The Holy Spirit will do work through the church okay so the work of uh of, of uh, our work today is still we, we are still required to preach the word teach the word through the power of the holy spirit so where there is no preacher the holy spirit does not just float around and start convicting people you know um sometimes that could happen in certain atmospheres but the gospel has to be preached so he's going to do it through us or in partnership uh with the church um the next thing i want you to see is that the holy spirit was the first to make contact with man. Okay, so let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, you see to the formation of man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse, verse 7 it says, and, man, and God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So you see that when it says he breathed into him. Okay. Amen. Yes. So um, <clears throat> that breath there is, what, is the word ruach. Ruach talks about the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that first contact was with the Holy Spirit. 
And it's interesting to see when you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which we're going to look at later, that the Holy Spirit's ministry has always been more of on the earth with man. So we've always had the Spirit working on the earth with man. Um, the Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 2, how the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. Okay. Genesis 3, 8. You can put that up. Genesis 3, 8. Genesis 3, verse 8. What does it say? And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Now, when you read in the original Hebrew, that cool of the day there is Ruach. It's talking about the, actually, it's the presence of God, the Spirit of God. Okay? So it's more than just the wind. It was just the wind. It wasn't just wind. It was the presence of God. Because the Bible says that they hid themselves, the presence of God. You see, so they, they were already acclimatized with the presence of God uh, right from his creation. The Holy Spirit was working hand in hand. And every morning, the Spirit of God would come and have fellowship. Interestingly, when you see that scripture, it says they heard the voice of the Lord. You see. So the, 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 the Lord was there, voice was there, and the cool was there. So literally, I believe Adam had an encounter with all three persons of the Godhead who were involved in his in his training or his raising, or God raising him up. Okay? And so uh, Holy Spirit was the first person in John chapter 2, verse, sorry, in Genesis 2, verse 7, to really make contact with man. Okay? So let's say, talk a little bit about... Um, we're going to be talking about fellowship. Uh, so G the Holy Spirit, you see my fourth presentation there. It says that the Holy Spirit is a person, just like Jesus is a person. We become his body and experience his fellowship. Okay, so the Holy Spirit lives inside the church. We are his body, the body that he fills. The church is his body. You and I become his temple. First, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 a common scripture that is going to guide some of the things we're going to be sharing today. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. You want to put that up for us? Uh, let's see if I... Now the scripture, is it going to show up in the Abiding Word ministry slide or is it going to be elsewhere? Because I can't tell when it comes up. Let's see. Is it up? Oh, but it's showing on the on the corner at the end at the lower portion, lower right. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen. It says that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit or the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. Okay, so we're look. We're going to look at. Uh, some aspects of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, what fellowship means. Um, and the reason we were talking about the Holy Spirit as a person is because you cannot have fellowship with, with fire. You cannot have fellowship with a, a, a piece of rock or anything that is not a human, you know, uh, not a person rather. So you, for you to have fellowship that, that with that, with something, that thing has to have some kind of personality, you know, to, to make communication, you know, and to share in, in that fellowship with you. So fellowship means friendship. Number two, it means partnership. Number three, it means communion. Um, now, when we talk about fellowship, we're not talking about an aspect of making requests and things like that. Fellowship is simply friendship. It doesn't always have to do. So when we begin to talk about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a platform for making requests. Because I know today most of our prayers always circle around, give me, give me, I want money, I want this. No. When we talk about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit, I need money, send money. That's not the purpose of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, okay? So from a biblical standpoint of view, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's important to understand. This is biblical now. Now, and I know sometimes maybe you 
You woke up one day and you shout, the Holy Spirit, give me money. And money came, okay? And God just, that, that was just God's mercy. But from a biblical standpoint of view, as you mature as a Christian, you know the purpose of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is not to meet your physical needs. If you have needs, you are supposed to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, okay? Um, even, it's not even, it does not even make sense to pray to Jesus in Jesus' name. It doesn't make sense. Do you understand me? So you're supposed to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, you see. So you don't pray to Jesus in his own name, you know. It doesn't mean we can't have fellowship with Jesus, but Jesus is our facilitator, our mediator. And uh, the one who is supposed to answer our prayers is the Father, okay? And Jesus said when he was on earth, he said, you know, a time will come, you will ask me nothing, but you will ask the Father. Because while he was walking on earth, a lot of times they asked him and then he he gave answers to their prayers. But he said, a time will come, you won't need to ask me, you will ask the Father, because the Father loves me just as he loves you, okay? So the purpose of fellowship, when we begin to talk about fellowship, we're talking about him helping you in different ways, comfort, strengthening you, empowering you. So it's not... Uh, the purpose of fellowship is not to ask the Holy Spirit, give me this, give me that, give me... No. Okay, because I've heard people pray like that, and you know it's not really scripturally... Big, uh, it's not scripturally accurate. So as you mature as a Christian, you have to understand. And uh, if we're going to get Jesus' results, then we have to do things the way Jesus did them. Okay, we can't just do them just because we saw somebody do it or whatever. It has to be scripturally based to get those kind of results. Okay? So we pray to the Father in the name of the Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to go to our next, next slide. Okay, so up here I've, I've listed the different um, uh, things that communion stands for, okay? Because most times we just say the communion of the Holy Spirit or we say the koinonia of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at each one of these. What does what each one mean? It's important for you to understand what each one means. Okay, now, um, when we talk about communion, communion often uh, is, is used in reference to participation in terms of eating and drinking, okay? First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, let's look at that. And there's so many other scriptures I could put up, but I'll just pick those ones that will help us make sure that we cover most of our topic. First Corinthians chapter 10... Verse 21, I wish I could see that scripture the way, because uh, the way it pops up, it actually pops up behind uh, Dr. Chu, so I can't, I can't read everything. Let's see if I can find this, the screen that you described. Uh, I don't see it on anybody's screen. That's fine. Okay, so this scripture says, let's see. It's actually talking about, it says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Okay? I'm trying to read it behind Dr. Chu. I can't see everything. Uh, you know, so and often when the Bible talks about communion, it often talks about eating and drinking. Are you with me? Okay? So when we begin to talk about the communion of the Holy Spirit, especially when we begin to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, it's important to understand that if you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, in terms of having communion with him, number one, when it comes to eating and drinking, there must be an appetite, okay? So note that down. If you have a pen and paper, you have to be, an you have to have an appetite. And that's why whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit or his ministry, we always ask people, are you hungry? You understand me? When you, whenever, every time I ask someone, have you been filled with the Spirit? And the person says, I don't know what you're talking about. The first thing I ask the person, you don't have an appetite. You understand me? Or, you know, are you feeling the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Do you want to feel? I don't know. Those people will never really experience him because the first thing when it comes to eating and drinking is that there must be an appetite. Um, you can cook food all day, but it requires an appetite to consume that thing, you see. And so when it comes to the things of the Spirit or communion of the Spirit, you have to have an appetite. You can't just be non challenge you can't just say well you know one day it will come and meet me no you have to have a hunger we talk about spiritual hunger okay and uh, if you say dr norm i don't know what, i don't understand what you mean by spiritual hunger okay you wake up in the morning first thing that comes to mind you have to eat food okay so in that same way when you wake up in the morning the first thing you begin to when you have a spiritual appetite the first thing you begin to think is about prayer about fellowship you want to spend time something in you the same way you crave for food your physical body craves for food that's how your spirit man begins to crave for the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the same way. 
Um, and if you don't have an appetite, I've always said this, uh, uh, when a child comes to uh, meet me in the clinic when I used to do pediatrics and the parents say he does not want to eat, uh -huh. I know there is something else the child is eating, you know, that does not allow him to eat. Either it's cookies or some junk, you know. So I, I tell them, look for the thing that he eats before you, you, you bring food. And so the same way, if you are not having a spiritual appetite for real communion with the spirit, it's because there are some other things that are consuming your appetite, okay? And your flesh is so alive and so active, which means sometimes you may need to fast. You may need to deny yourself of certain things to release your spirit to begin to crave for the presence of God. OK, sometimes it may be too much entertainment. You spend all day watching some of these movie TVs and movies that don't feed your spirit. It will clog you up and you will have no appetite. OK, because this is a practical class. Our goal is not just to fill your head with knowledge and then you leave this place and you can't do anything. No, we want to make sure that you're able. Number one, you're able to live what we're teaching you and you're able to teach others. That's the goal. You know, teach the nations about all that I did or observed according to what Jesus said. OK, so. We said communion has to do with eating and drinking. The second thing is that, that for you to eat uh, or drink, you have to open your mouth. Am I right? In the natural, you have to open your mouth. So it is in the spirit. That's why before anybody can be filled with the spirit or really have communion, you have to open your mouth. In worship, in prayers, you, your mouth has to open. You know, Ephesians 5.18. Can we see that? Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5.18, it says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And then it tells us how. Okay, next verse, what, what does it say? Speaking to yourself. So if you look at the verse we just read before that, it has a semicolon telling us what, how to be filled with the spirit. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when we talk about communion, or communicate or feeding when you're going to eat or drink in the presence of God, your mouth must open. And that's why anybody who comes to church, your hands are crossed, your mouth is shut, and you're looking around, you're not going to receive anything. Do you see? So your mouth has to be open. You have to worship. You know, open your mouth doesn't mean just open your mouth. Ah, and that's not what I'm talking about. But you have to, to worship, speak, worship, confess the word of God. That is how to have real communion. Okay. So when we talk about communion in the terms of eating and drinking, we're talking about receiving in that presence of God. You know, you have to have an appetite and you have to learn to use your oral, your oral faculty to speak, to worship, to praise. That's how you get filled with the spirit. You don't get filled by, you know, just closing your mouth and looking and, and observing what is going on. Amen. The second aspect of communion is the word communication. Okay. So communication has to do with releasing words, or releasing things, okay? Like when we say uh, a disease is communicable, that means that when you speak, you know, as you're breathing in and out, like, you know, like, like, uh, what COVID, <laughs> you know, you didn't need to, you didn't even need to touch anybody. If you're just around the person in the person's air, breathing the same air with the person, you can get it, you see? So that's how, when we begin to talk about the communication of the Holy Spirit, when his presence saturates your life, you can release him as you speak the word of God, as you communicate with people, the spirit of God is released, through speaking, you see. So if if you if there is sickness somewhere and you only just look and you keep quiet, it's not going anywhere. You have to open your mouth and speak. So we talk about communication. So it has to come out of your mouth, you see. And so the power of God is released through speaking. First Corinthians chapter two verse four. These are the words of Paul. Paul, First Corinthians chapter two verse four. <clears throat> I think it was Paul that said that. He said, "When I came to you." Uh, he says, I came to you not with, with, he said, my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and power, you see. So he said, my speech, the, he's speaking. So he, he, he was able to communicate God's power. So we're teaching you as ministers, when you spend time drinking in the presence of God, fellowshipping with the spirit of God, until he saturates your life, when you leave your closet, you go and communicate his presence, you go and communicate his power as you begin to speak, the power of God is released. Okay, I've always said it before that the quiet Christian cannot win, you see. So as long as you say, oh, I will, let me be quiet. If I'm quiet, the enemy will leave me alone. No, you know, quietness there is a blank check for the enemy. You must learn to communicate, to speak 
the spirit. The Christian is a, is a, is a, is a, is a confessional person. Confession actually is part of your salvation. And confession also is also part of your walk with God. So we're supposed to be confessional people. You see, the world will say, they'll say, knock on wood, don't say it, keep quiet. You know, that's not the Christian way. That's the kingdom of God. We don't keep quiet. We speak. The Bible says we have the same spirit of faith. It says having the same spirit of faith, I believe, therefore I speak. Okay? So if you have faith, faith speaks. It doesn't just keep quiet and say, you know, let me keep quiet. If I talk too much, Satan will come after me. He will come after you whether you talk or not. So you better speak. Amen. Okay. The next thing we want to look at there is friendship. Okay? Friendship. So when we begin to talk about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we're also trying to talk about friendship. So the Holy Spirit is there also as a friend. Okay? So he can comfort you. He can give you wisdom. He can give you advice. He can direct you. He can, if you give him the opportunity. So when you wake up early in the morning and you go to your place of prayer or wherever that may be, expect the Holy Spirit to talk to you. Okay. So don't just come there and make requests and run out. You know, you don't even worship. You don't, you just make requests and run out. That is a, is a deficient Christian life. Make sure um, you uh, divide your prayer time. Okay enough time to make requests or whatever you may call it, enough time to worship, enough time for the word, and also time to keep quiet, where you just stay quiet in his presence and let him speak, you see, because he wants to talk too. You're not the only one who likes to talk. He wants to tell you. He wants to give you direction. He wants to comfort your heart. So make always as a minister or as you teach other believers to grow spiritually, they need to divide their quiet time, you know, or time they spend in the presence of the Lord into time to pray and make requests, time for intercession, Time for studying the word and also time. There must be a time just to, you shut up because sometimes we always, we're always always talking and our minds are always running. It's a time to keep quiet and let the spirit of God minister to you. Let him touch your heart. Let him speak words. Sometimes the words, he begins to reveal things. Just let him speak. Amen. So he's there also as uh, a friend. Okay. Communion also talks about partnership. So the Holy Spirit, as we said earlier on, is our partner. So he's here to partner with us to do the work of the ministry. Okay, so he's here to help us, to partner with us. He cannot do it alone, and we can do it alone too. So it's going to require our partnership, working hand in hand with the Spirit of the Lord. Acts 5, verse 13. Acts 5, 13. Hmm. Acts, uh, let's see. Let me make sure I'm correct. Acts 5, 13. It says, and the rest does not join. Uh, let me see. Can't really read it that well behind that screen. Acts 5, 13. What does it say? It says, and of the rest does no man join them himself to them, but the people magnified them. Amen. It says, and... And believers were more added to the Lord, multiplied both of men and of women. Okay, so this is where the church began to multiply as we work hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26, I think we've read that before, where Jesus says, when the Spirit of God is come, he will guide us into all truth. John 15, 26, let me see exactly what I was trying to look for. But when this comforter is come, whom I will send from you the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Okay, verse 27 says, and ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. So he says, Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit will testify of him. We also are supposed to be witnesses. So it's a partnership between us and the Holy Spirit. So he's your friend, he's my friend, and he's also a partner that we have uh, to do the work of God. The next thing about the word commun a communion or koinonia, the Greek word koinonia from that word in the Bible, from the Greek, is the word intimacy or intercourse. So the Holy Spirit is also here for intimacy. He is, he, 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 you can make him so, so, oh Lord Jesus, you can make him so dear, so loving, so intimate to the very inward parts of your being, like a husband and wife, those secret parts, so secret moments, the Holy Spirit wants to share with you. And that's where the power of, of, of ministry is. The power of ministry is not always just in praying and preaching and shouting and jumping, but it's also in the secret, the intimacy, that time you spend with him, okay? And the Bible says that uh, the father that will meet you in the secret place, 
He says he will reward you openly. You see, so your open reward is a product of your intimate time in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So all, always remember, um, and that's why I love the ministry of, 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 of Catherine Kuhlman uh, and, uh, you know, when she was alive, because she revealed that the, the aspect of that intimacy and intercourse with the Holy Spirit, how we can be so one and, and just surrender to him. And then he begins to show up in our lives. Okay. The next thing there is... Uh, Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 15. This is where Paul was uh, speaking on the intimacy that we're supposed to have with the Holy Spirit. And that's where he was telling the Corinthian church. He said, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? He says, don't you understand? You see, 1 Corinthians, let's see that scripture. and says, uh, let's see. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 15. Okay, so if anybody asks any questions, let me know because I, I kind of close my chat box and I can't uh I can't keep up with that. First Corinthians chapter six and fifteen. What does it say? It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What know ye not that? He which is joined to and hallowed is one body. For the two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he said, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man committeth, he doeth without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Okay, so when we begin to talk about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it contrasts it to the intimacy you share with your, you're only supposed to share with your spouse. You know what I mean? He said, how, how dare you take your body and go share it with the harlot or somebody outside the context of marriage? So it actually uses this context of, of intimacy uh, with husband and wife in terms of our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he wants to saturate your body. He wants to manifest himself in your body, but he will not do that if you use your body in corruption, okay, or outside the context of marriage. The next word for fellowship is the word contribution, Okay. <clears throat> so our union with the Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to supply the spiritual needs of the body of Christ. The Bible says whenever we come in the presence of God, everybody's supposed to come with a psalm, a hymn, spiritual song, some kind of contribution, okay? So that means you don't just come to the house of God empty and dry. You understand? You are supposed to come prayed up. You're supposed to come worshipped up. You know, a lot of people come to us and say, oh, I didn't like the worship, the worship team. They didn't take me to heaven. You're supposed to come in the realm of heaven. And then you supply. It's called the supply of the spirit where everybody is making supply. Okay, so it's not the responsibility of the worship leader to lift you into the spirit. You should come prayed up and on fire so that everybody, the Bible calls that the supply of the spirit. And you can see that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. Or is it Philippians or Philemon? Let's see. Uh, it should be Philippians. I think it's Philippians. Let's see. I just put here Phil. Philippians 1.19. What does it say? It says, this is Paul speaking. It says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. So this is Paul saying that the prayers of the other, of the, of the members of the church would, re, would, would result in some kind of, of uh, salvation or deliverance because he was in prison. You understand me? So he's trying to say to turn to be his salvation or his freedom. He's not trying to say that he's not born again or he's not saved, but he's trying to say that their prayers, he would benefit from their prayers. So that means that as you come together as a body, your, your prayer life can affect somebody who doesn't pray. Everybody is being is receiving a supply. Okay? So the fellowship of the Spirit also has to do with what? Contribution. So every one of us have a contribution to make. The next word there for fellowship is distribution. The Bible talks about how the Spirit of God distributes his gifts and his abilities as he wills. Okay, so the Spirit of God distributes, uh, you know, so you don't complain and say, oh, this person is always prophesying. While me, I'm always a word of knowledge. Why? You know what I mean? He distributes as he wills. Okay, so you bring what God gives you and, and contribute to the house of God. The next word for fellowship is participation participation okay the bible says that we are partakers of the holy spirit so we have been called it's, to what do you call it bible school sorry mm -hmm. 
Did somebody ask a question? I didn't hear that. Uh, Dr. Chu, you're muted. So I, I didn't hear, I can't hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, was it, you're not asking me a question? Okay. No. Okay, so the spirit, we, the Bible says we are, the, uh, the word communion or koinonia also means participation. So we've been called to participate. Um, what does it mean to participate? For instance, when you go to a, a soccer game or a football game and you're sitting in the stands, you're not participating. You are just, uh, <laughs> you're just observing, you see. Those people on the field are the ones participating. So when we talk about the participation, we're talking about an engagement with the things of the spirit. So you're not just passive and, and things are just happening. No, you're part of passive. So you participate through prayer, through speaking in tongues, through worship, you, you, you're involved in what God is doing. The Bible calls us participators. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 actually talks about those who are partakers of the Holy Spirit. When they turn back, uh, uh, it's difficult for them to be saved. Okay, so the Bible calls us partakers of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so as we mature as a child of God, you become a partaker in his ministry. Amen. So let's move on to the next. I think we're good with time. Okay, so we're going to talk about his person because we, we see we have to understand him as a person for us to have fellowship with him. So what makes you and I a person? Is it just because we have a body? Of course, you've probably been to, you know, have you ever been to a funeral and you look in that casket and, you know, you just know that this is not the same person. You know, he looks the same, but it's not the same. Something has left the house, you see. So a person, being a person is much more than just a physical body. Okay? So uh, it's more than uh, the presence of a body. Uh, what makes you an eye? Sometimes it may be Excuse me. Pen. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what makes uh, a person, the person's looks, behavior, thoughts, ideologies, all these things are what make up who a person is, you know? And all these qualities mentioned require an intellect, which means that person has to have a mind, uh, a will of his own, Okay. Um, so though we have symbolic elements of the spirit of God, it's important to understand he's a person. Okay. So let's look at, uh, 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 Jan Jan John 16, 13, John 16, 13, John 16, 13. And it says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. Okay, so the Holy Spirit has the capacity to, to guide, you see. So, uh, you know, you cannot be guided by things that are not living. So that means that he has a he has an under, he has an intellect. The Bible in that same scripture says he sees, he speaks, he hears. So all these are qualities of a person. So it's important to understand that uh, there is evidence based on the scripture that the Holy Spirit is a person. And Jesus often used the word he. He didn't say it. He didn't say use inanimate uh, objects or anything. He always says he when the he the Spirit of Truth is come. So he referred the Holy Spirit as a person. And I think that's kind of where I believe the Especially, uh, somebody said, please, what is the chapter again? <laughs> I am lost. Okay. Please don't be lost. <laughs> okay. Where are we? Let's, sorry. Uh, did I even take off the sh Can you see still the screen or did it go off? No, we see the screen. Okay. I'm trying to up where I am. Let's go to chapter. Okay, so that scripture we read says he hears, he sees, he thinks. So he has an intellect. Okay, First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse eleven. 
read that and it says um the spirit distributes the gifts of the of the gifts as he wills so the holy spirit has a will obviously jesus also had a will remember in the garden when he prayed not my will but thine be done okay so jesus had to submit his will to the father okay so uh the holy spirit also has a will but he doesn't do what he wants he always does an agreement, a total, a perfect union of the Godhead, perfect agreement. Okay, the next thing there is that on my bullet number five says he has emotions. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30. Ephesians 4, 30. We'll put that up for us. Ephesians 4.30. What does it say? It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the seal of the believer. Okay, it's like when you put to buy something and uh, you pay for it partially and then you they give you, you know, some kind of receipt and say, nobody can pick this up. This person has already paid for it, and he's coming to pick it up on this day. You see, that's kind of what, how the believers have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So he is the proof that uh, we have been bought with a price and that Jesus will come and, and, and take us home. Okay, so the Bible tells us, do not grieve him. And so when it says the word grieve there, it means that, you know, do not wound him deeply. That's what the, the word there means. Okay, so the, the Spirit of God um, can be grieved. Okay? So let's move on. So this is our second to the last slide. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at a few things about his personality. Okay. Um, just getting to understand who the, for us to be able to walk with the Holy Spirit, you must understand his personality. The first thing I want you to notice is that the Holy Spirit is the only one in the Godhead that the Bible tells us specifically not to grieve. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you never see grieve not the son. Uh, you never see grieve not the father. It's the spirit of God. And I believe that is based on the kind of um, person, personality he has. That he is, he is likely to be grieved or to be, to be greatly wounded. Okay. And so uh, I think he was the one that Jesus, uh, uh, where was that when the disciples, not the disciples, when the Pharisees, began to say, uh, he, they began to attribute the Holy Spirit to the works of the devil, okay? That what it actually means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, okay? So you're going to see that in some of your questions. Um, you know, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? You know, so bl to blaspheme the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily mean, oh, you you know, you made a mistake, you commit, you know, you you made a mistake, and therefore the Holy Spirit has left you because you blasphemed it. That's not what it means. To blaspheme the Spirit in the context of where we saw it in the Bible March, Mark 3.29. Mark 3.29. I think that's where that is. There are about two places that Jesus, uh, two references from some of the books. Uh, Mark 3.29. Uh, am I right? Mark 3. Okay. Mark 3.29. So I'm going to read it. It says here, but he that bless, blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Okay? Now, when you read verse 22 in that same scripture, they began to say that Jesus Christ was casting out devils by the power of the devil. You understand me? And Jesus Christ had already said before that he casted out spirits by, uh, by the finger of God. Okay? So, to blaspheme the spirit means to... Uh, attribute the works of Christ to the devil. Okay, so it's always a, it's something that you don't want to cross that line. And most people who cross that line, a lot of times are do it consciously. Uh, and you know, um, it's unlikely for somebody who is a child of God whose word have I ever blasphemed the spirit to have blasphemed the spirit. These people do it consciously, like the people in the days of Jesus. The Pharisees, interestingly, many of them 
uh, how do I put it? Many of the Pharisees were conscious. They knew the truth. Many of them knew the truth and they refused. Okay. I believe some of them were actually working hand in hand with Satan. Do you understand me? Because there is no way Jesus will resurrect and you will bring out your money and pay people. Knowing that you resurrected, you pay people to tell people not to believe, you know, to lie that something has happened. That means that they were, they were really, many of them were given over to the devil to, 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 to prove or to fight against the purposes of God. So they were out and some of them were ignorant and, and, and they still got saved like Paul. Paul was fighting against God, but he didn't, you know, when the truth was revealed to him, he changed. But there are some people that no matter how much truth is revealed to them, they've, they have, they have made a league with Satan to fight the purposes of God. And those kind of people are in a very dangerous place um, to be. Okay? Uh, now, often in the scriptures, uh, the Holy Spirit is given feminine characteristics. I'm not trying to say the Holy Spirit is not a woman, okay? However, a lot of times the things that are used to describe him, a good example, I should, uh, let's see, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. It says there that... Um, it says, uh, let's go there, just so that you have an understanding of what I'm saying. Genesis 1, 2. So the Holy Spirit is not a woman, but often, you know, some of the characteristics that he's given are more feminine. Okay, so many people would say that, you know, they would say he's, he, he is, you know, because if you know, when man, when when God created man, uh, he said, let them be, let, let's make them in our own image. You understand me? Um, and so even though God, uh, uh, the male uh, genders often used to describe God, there is still the feminine aspect in, in the Godhead, okay? And the feminine aspect in the Godhead often is a manifestation of the attribute, attributes of the Spirit in terms of his gentleness and his, uh, you know, his easily being grieved and things like that, okay? But let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay, so that word there is the word rakaf, and it actually means uh, it's like a mother hen trying to hatch an egg. That's 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 what the Greek, I mean, the Hebrew tries to describe it as, as like a mother hen trying to hatch an egg. Uh, another good example is in the, I call it the the the, the parable of, uh, 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 in Luke chapter 15. Literally, it shows there's a revelation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the first one is the parable of the good shepherd, which is Jesus. Okay, that goes to look for the sheep. The second parable is the parable of the lost coin, of the woman who sweeps the house until she finds the missing coin. Okay, so in this context, the Holy Spirit is revealed in front in, in terms of a lady, you know, or a woman in a house, sweeping the house. The third context, uh, the third person is the is the father, of course, the parable of the prodigal son, where it's kind of revealing the father's love for his lost children. Okay, but in this scripture, uh, Luke 15, 8. It describes the Holy Spirit as a woman who sweeps the house. She lights a candle. Uh, and so the candle there talks about revelation. Uh, and, you know, and um, I've always shared that the Holy Spirit is given to the church. Okay, so the, 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 the good shepherd goes out to look for the sheep that's lost and finds him. The Holy well, Spirit doesn't go out. Yeah, somebody said more nurturing. Yes, yes, that's one of his offices is to nurture us until we are able to come into the presence of the Father. That's very good. I love that uh, from Tracy. Yes, more nurturing. That's his his office. So his goal is to nurture us, to bring us to maturity. Okay, so that we can walk in our maturity. Okay, so and it's the same thing with a mother. A mother's job is more of nurturing her child. Okay. You know, Father, well, God help you. He may not be able to nurture that much. You know, Dad, if you can't do this, hey, just come, come, let's go. Let's go clean the garage. That's the dad's, dad's, you know. The mom will say, oh, no, take it easy. You know, he's, he's not strong enough yet. Let's, you know, the mom is always nurturing. And that's how the Holy Spirit nurtures, you know, us and prepares us to walk with the Father. Okay? Uh, also, you see that in uh, in uh, Genesis 8, 9, he's, all, he's described as the dove that uh, looks for where to rest her feet. Okay, um, and then, you know, the dove goes several times and then the third time does not return. And all that symbolizes, we'll see that under the symbols of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the next thing about the Holy Spirit that is important to understand is that his goal is to glorify Jesus. So as a minister, you must understand he is here to glorify Jesus. John 16, 14. John 16, 14. 
That's where Jesus said, he shall glorify me. For he shall take of, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Okay? So the Holy Spirit's ministry or his personality is the glorification of Jesus. Okay? So um, I've always said this, especially with younger Christians. When you walk into a place and um, you can't find Jesus, okay? Whether it's a preacher or whatever, and, you know, all you see is how rich the preacher is or how much money he has or, you know, everything is, is, is glorification of self. A lot of times that person is not speaking by the power of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God comes into a place, he always glorifies Jesus, okay? And you must remember that even as a minister, as you go to do the things of God, as you go to preach, if your focus is to glorify yourself, the power of God is going to be absent, you see. So the purpose of the Spirit or his ministry is to glorify Jesus. So it's all about the glorification of Jesus and exalting Jesus. So every time you're around a ministry, you will know a true ministry that is of Christ because it will point to Jesus. You see, true prophecy points to Jesus. You see, <clears throat> I know today, and especially on the internet, there's a lot of prophetic movements. And sometimes when you listen to some of these, you know, some of these prophetic movements, they don't glorify Jesus. I mean, after the, all the prophets and everything, all that you're saying is, oh, this man of God is, is the most powerful on the earth. That's all you say. Oh, this man is one of, oh, how did he call my, my credit card number? And all that. A lot of that, that, that's not the ministry of the spirit. When the ministry of the spirit comes into a place, Jesus is lifted high. You understand me? Every other man begins to hide behind the cross. Okay. And so that's one of the ways you will know if you are in a place where Jesus is glorified. And sometimes it may start out as a good ministry and then down the line, you know, pride comes in and everything. You can tell when Jesus is, is no longer uh, the center of everything. Okay. And that's where your wisdom will be. <clears throat> okay. We said also that the spirit of God, uh, he is the spirit of revelation. So where the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you're going to realize there's, there's a lot of revelation. He comes to reveal the word, like in that Genesis chapter, not sorry, Luke 15, 8, that talks about the woman who comes to sweep, okay, and lights a candle. So the Spirit of God is the Spirit of revelation. So when I see people say, oh, I can't read it. I don't even know what it's in the Bible. I don't understand the Bible. I wonder that they don't know the Holy Spirit. Because if you know the Holy Spirit, the Bible will begin to open up to him, to you. Okay, if you if you if you don't understand the Bible, that's why he's there. So you need to ask him and uh, ask the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, you know, blessed Holy Spirit. Instead of saying, Holy Spirit, give me money, give me money. You say, Holy Spirit, teach me the word. That's why he's there. I, I don't I'm reading my Bible. I can't understand it or I'm supposed to prepare for this thing. I don't have a clue. Reveal it to me. And that's why before you know it, he will start. you just read it and, and everything starts clicking together. Because, of course, he is the one who wrote the Bible. So he will help you. To understand okay the next thing apart from the nurturing aspect of the spirit is his sensitivity you see the holy spirit is sensitive and i said before he's the only one that the bible says do not grieve it was almost like the father and the son are almost protecting the holy spirit that's fact when jesus said he said um if you he said he, he jesus said it this way he said and i will pray the father you see, and he will give you another comfort. That prayer there is not just a regular prayer. It means almost like a pleading. I'm going to plead with the Father just to release the Holy Spirit. It's almost as like if the Father is saying, no, I don't want to release the Holy Spirit. He's so dear. You understand me? So there is there is a, there is an aspect of the Holy Spirit being, being sensitive. So you need to understand that when you begin to have fellowship with the Spirit, that he's sensitive. You understand me? You can be so, so empowered by the Spirit, and what, a visitor comes to your house and you forget that he's there and you say something that grieves the spirit. You understand me? And before you know it, you sense that the, the intensity of that power begins to dwindle. And by the time that person goes, you realize, ah, something I've missed something. There's something I must have said that must have hurt the Holy Spirit. And that's that's about fellowship. And all you say, Lord, oh, I'm sorry, I made that mistake. Help me not to make that mistake again. So you you continue in that fellowship because he's sensitive. You know, but most of the time we say, Oh, I, I didn't do anything wrong. No, if the spirit of God is wounded. You need to have, you know, recognize and have that fellowship. Okay, I've always said it before that you know, um, uh, uh, for you to relate, like it's like a husband and wife. For a man to relate with a woman, women are sensitive. Am I right? Yes, they are sensitive. You see, if a woman comes home and she's not saying anything, you know, you need to find out. You know, you say well, everything is any is there any problem? And the woman says there's no problem. You know, there's problem. You know, <laughs> so you have to press. You have to fellowship. That's how she's sensitive. 
You know I mean? You may just feel, oh, after all, I just do my thing. No, 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 no. You have to calm down and, and have fellowship and slow down. And that's how the Holy Spirit is. You have to, to press in that place, you know, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, you know, oh, this person has been coming to your house. You've been spending too much time with this person. You don't have time enough for me anymore. You see? So God is jealous. Uh, the Bible tells us, in fact, you know, tells us that God is a jealous God. So the Holy Spirit is also jealous. You know, if you spend all day watching entertainment and you don't, when it's time to pray, you fall asleep, you grieve the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, and, and so you have to recognize that he, he wants time. He wants attention. Okay. Um, the next thing about the Spirit is that he's powerful. Psalm 110 verse 2 talks about the, the power of God being released from, the, from Zion. And that's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Psalm 110. Uh, so it's, it is a Messianic scripture, but it, it talks about how Jesus rules and how heaven rules the earth. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. 110. Let me open that. Psalm 110, verse 2. It says, The Lord hath sent, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. It says, the people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Okay, so the rod of God's strength is actually the spirit. You know what I'm saying? The scepter of the kingdom is the spirit, the power of the spirit. It says, they shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Okay, so this is God speaking to Jesus Christ. But it says that the rod of his strength will come out of Zion. So that was the, that's actually talking about the release of the Spirit. So that's how the Father actually released the Spirit uh, after Jesus had been crowned or had been uh, glorified. Okay, so the Spirit of God is the power of God that is released. He carries that power and executes the purposes of God. Okay? <clears throat> um, so he is powerful. So even though he is gentle, he is, he is powerful. Okay? So we're going to go to our, our final slide. And let's look a little bit about the symbols of the Holy Spirit. So as I said before, that the Holy Spirit is not, a, is not an element, but the elements often are used to describe the Holy Spirit. And the reason it's important to understand this, when you read Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it always says that the, the visible things are used to reveal the invincible. Okay, uh, I've, I've shared that before. Uh, about the visible and the invincible creation. So there are two arms of creation, the visible creation and the invincible. So what we see around us is the visible creation, but there is an invincible creation, talking about the spirit world. And the spirit world is more real than even this world that we live in, okay? And so most of the things you see around us, most of the physical things are supposed to reveal the spirit, spirit realm so that we are without excuse, even the eternal Godhead, okay? So that's what Roman 1, Roman 1.20 Okay, so um, one of the symbols of the Spirit is fire, okay? And we see that Acts chapter 2, verse 2, we see that when this, on the day of Pentecost, uh, what lighted upon them looked like tongues of fire, okay? Um, John was the one who said in Mark 1, 8, he said, Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. So fire is often used as a symbol of the Spirit, that fire often refers to power, often refers to the purifying power of the Spirit, sanctifying work of the Spirit. It's important to understand the difference between quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit. They're not the same thing, okay? So to, to, to grieve the Spirit means to wound the Spirit deeply, okay? Which means, obviously, to do something wrong, okay? Like somebody who goes to lie, a true child of God, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Or the Spirit of God tells you, um, I want you to do this thing and say, no, I'm going to do my own thing. You are going to grieve the Holy Spirit, okay? Quenching the Spirit often talks about in relation to fire, okay? So when we quench the Spirit, actually means to uh, uh, put out the fire, okay? And often it's all, often in, refer, in reference to the gifts of the Spirit, okay? So they don't necessarily mean the same thing. For instance, if we have a prayer meeting and the Spirit starts stirring you to give a prophetic word and you refuse, you may not be grieving the spirit, but definitely you'll be quenching the spirit, which means that gift you, you stop that gift from operating through you, okay? 
Now, if you go home and you go steal somebody's property, definitely you'll grieve the spirit. You won't be quenching him. But it's important to understand the difference between quenching and grieving. So quenching often has to do with the gifts of the spirit, the manifestation of the power of the spirit. You know, So you have to yield to the Holy Spirit so that you don't quench or put out the fire. Okay? So, um, for instance, a lot of the churches that don't believe in the gifts of the spirit, they're not necessarily grieving him, but they're quenching him. And so it's very difficult to see... Um, it's very difficult to see a, the, the, a manifestation of the spirit in a place where they don't believe in, in in his operations. Okay, for instance, in some of the churches that say you know the spirit of God has no longer there. You know, when the apostles died, the spirit of God stopped moving. You know, they may not necessarily be grieving the spirit, but they're quenching. So in those kind of settings, you're unlikely to really see uh, a manifestation of the spirit or a manifestation of healing and things like that because of the posture they've taken in terms of their doctrines to hinder his fire from burning or his, uh, you know, his gifts from manifesting. Okay. <clears throat> the fire also refers to the ability to spread. Okay. Especially in like in, when there's a move of God or revival, the fire of God also uh, reveals that aspect. So fire, the same way fire moves and fire spreads where the, the conditions are met. Do you understand me? If the, the next place the fire is supposed to spread is all wet, the fire is unlikely to spread. So there are conditions for revival too. So revival fire doesn't just break up, break out. It may start somewhere, but it won't spread without certain conditions. You see, okay? So that's why sometimes you come into a place and you, there's a move of God. And after one month, two months, everything dies off. You see? Okay, good example. Let's just assume you start up a fire, okay? Maybe the, wind, the weather is cold, as some people do here in Kentucky, you know, they go to their backyard, they put together some wood, and they start up a fire. Okay, if you don't keep supplying the wood, the fire wood, that fire is going to go out. You see, and that's how revival is. If you do not continue to supply the things that are necessary, the revival will not continue. Okay, so there are things that can quench the spirit in, in a revival setting. You know, for instance, division. If there's division and things like that, those things will put with the revival won't last very long. Okay, and the enemy knows that, and so the enemy knows often will use the church itself, to fight against the very thing the church has been praying for. So you can have a church crying, oh God, send revival, send revival, fire starts, and then you know everybody starts fighting each other for, for nothing. You know, And then before you know it, everything is gone. So uh, uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the fire, we're talking about the ability for, for the moves of God to spread. Fire also talks about the ability to bring judgment on opposing forces. Okay? So uh, it's important to understand how Fire also talks about judgment. Okay, good example was Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, they were judged by the Spirit of God because they lied. Okay, so the Holy Spirit judged them and they and they died. Okay, so fire also talks about judgment. <clears throat> water. So when we begin to talk about water, we're talking about the dimension of the Spirit, especially in terms of salvation. Uh, Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 is an interesting scripture. It says, with joy shall you draw water from the wells of, of salvation. With joy, you shall draw waters from the wells of salvation. So uh, a lot of times, uh, water is in, in terms of the spirit, is referring to the dimension of salvation, okay? Ezekiel 47 verse one gives the different levels of water uh, that's coming out of the temple, okay? <clears throat> the next symbol is oil. Oil often talks about the Holy Spirit in terms of his empowering, Ability, ordination, uh, healing, his ability to be a seal, his ability to protect. So Psalm 92 verse 10 says, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. It says, my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn, and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Acts 10 38 says that Jesus Christ was anointed, the Holy Spirit anointed, God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good, okay? Acts chapter 4, verse, so Luke 4, 18 also says uh, how Jesus Christ, uh, I think that's where he said, uh, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm not sure. But you want to put that up? Luke 4, 4, 18. Luke 4, 18. What does it say? Okay, so that's when Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Okay, so... The oil aspect of the Holy Spirit often refers to ordination. It refers to the anointing of the Spirit. 
enablement, assignments, and things that the Holy Spirit comes to do in our lives, his protection, his ability to seal us from any work of the enemy. Okay? Wind, Ezekiel 37, verse 9. That aspect of the Spirit talks about, number one, the power of the Spirit and our ability to be led by him. John 3, verse 8, talks about how the uh, wind blows where it wills, and you cannot know where it goes, but you can tell where it's moving, okay? So the Spirit's moving. Sometimes the Spirit's ability to lead you is like wind, okay? Like so when you're walking in the wind, you can tell what direction the wind is blowing, even though you can't see it. And sometimes that's how the Spirit leads. So it's not every time you're going to hear a voice calling, saying, oh, Kefra, Kefra, come, come and follow me this way. No, sometimes you just sense a pulling that way. Sometimes you just sense him, you just sense his person or his personality walking in a certain direction. You know, there's sometimes, especially when I'm ministering, sometimes I may be looking and I just sense that it's almost as if the Lord is looking in a different direction and, and I just turn in that direction. You, you know, I think the last uh, conference I had in my church, uh, I think it was like, uh, yeah, about like a month ago or so, you know, I was ministering and uh, I was walking in one direction and then it was almost as if suddenly I sensed that the Spirit of God turned inside of me and began to walk in the opposite direction. So I just stopped, I turned, walked, and I walked towards that section and the power of God hit some girl and she began to manifest demons and, you know, we ended up doing some deliverance on her. But, you know, it's, it's, that's how the, it's almost like, it's like wind. It's, it just, he leads you. So when we talk about the wind of the spirit, we're talking about his leading, his ability to lead. He's invincible. And so as you, as you mature as a child of God, you must learn what we call the non-verbal cues of the spirit and how he moves. You see, you know, you can tell when he's greed. You can tell when he's moving in a certain direction. You can tell when he's burning inside you like a fire. You must know how to respond in all those things. Okay? It's just like when you're when, when, when you're doing marriage counseling. You tell them, no, you have to know how to, as a man, you have to know how to deal with a woman. You know, you can't deal with her like you're dealing with a fellow man. You have to be more soft and more gentle. That's how we learn to fellowship with the Spirit. Amen. Okay. Uh, and the final one I have here on my list is the dove. Okay, Dove always talks about purity. Mark 3, 16 talks about the spirit descending like a dove. Okay, Mark 1, 10, same thing. So when we talk about the dove, we're talking about his, his uh, purity, number one. Okay, I've shared that before. The dove is one of the very few birds or animals that maintains his, his, his life partner. Okay, so doves, they, they don't jump from, you know, around like many men do. Pium, pium, pium. They don't do that, you know, <laughs> they stick with their partner, okay? So the Holy Spirit is a revelation of God's purity, the peace of God. Um, the Bible talks about the peace of God and his ability to guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. And that's in Philippians 4, verse 7. It says, and the peace of God shall guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. So the peace uh, is one of the ways that God leads the child of God. And it's important to understand that sometimes... God may not speak or the Holy Spirit may not speak, but it may just be that release of peace, you see, guarding you in a certain area. And I always tell people, if you get into anything and you lose that peace, know that God is not in that thing, that you need to withdraw. Do not push your way into anything when you lose your peace. You have to learn to protect and to guard your peace. Okay, and with that, I will bring this teaching to an end. Let's take questions or anything else. So the chat is open. If you want to type in there or you want to speak, it's up to you. I'm going to quickly look at some of my questions and just make sure that I did not leave anything out. Question? Any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Or type it into the chat. You type into the chat. No questions. Questions. This is your moment. Yes, All right, there's a question now in the chat. Questions. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. My name is Leone Nicholas, and don't I'm not getting my my um uh, 
sitting on my email. I have to keep asking my friend to send it to me. No, 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 we can talk discuss that after. This is just on this topic. Okay, so I see a question here. Yes, yes. If the Holy Spirit is quenched, how do you refresh it? Okay, so first of all, remember we're not talking about a thing. So, so how do you refresh him? So you you can repent whatever caused him to be quenched. Remember what we said: quenches. For instance, you're in a prayer meeting and then the Holy Spirit is 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 stirring you to say something. Okay, I've had that experience. And then you were scared. You're like, oh, am I sure this is good? You know, maybe this is not me. And then the moment you do that, somebody next to you opens their mouth and starts saying exactly the same thing. You know that you you have quenched the spirit because he wanted to use you. That doesn't mean that God, that God has left you. But you just repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Next time, I will know what to do. So next time when the spirit of God stirs you, open your mouth and speak. See, is that simple? What about if you had to do with sin? You know? Okay, so if it has to do with sin, which is grieving the spirit, repentance. Okay, you have to repent. Okay, and uh, most people, when they hear the word repent, they think it's only for unbelievers. No, believers too have to repent. Okay, and um, I've been teaching this currently, but when biblical repentance has multiple components, okay, number one, you have to acknowledge that you've done it. Okay, so you, in repentance, you acknowledge that you've done wrong. If you're still arguing that I'm not at fault, you've not really repented. Okay. Number two, biblical repentance also has what we call godly sorrow, which means that you're sorry for what you've done. You have that. The Bible says the broken and the contrite heart, God will not be there. So there's an aspect of brokenness, you see. So it's not just, I'm sorry, and then you go back and do the same thing. No, there has to be an acknowledgement that you've done wrong. You recognize you've done wrong. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're repentant towards it. Repentance also has to do with um, confession. So you have to tell the Lord that you're sorry. Okay, and also has to do with forsaking. The Bible says he that repented and forsaketh his sin. So you, that means that when you repent or that, you don't go back to do the same thing over and over again. So if there's true repentance, there's going to be forsaking. Okay, so these are some of the components of biblical repentance. So it's not just, I'm sorry, and then you go back and do the same thing. Okay, the Bible talks about worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is regret. Like Judas, you regret I, I was caught, I, I, you know, something like that. And he goes to hang himself. That's not repentance. True repentance is towards God, okay, and does and leads you to restoration and not to God commit suicide. Okay, it says here, what's the what's the last Bible verse? Wh which one are you referring to? About the symbols of the dove. So Matthew 3, 16, Mark 1, 10. Uh, we're going to sh share this slide with you, the, uh, the, the students, tomorrow morning, so you can uh, use that to study. Okay, if you're referring to uh, the peace of God, it's Philippians 4, 7, and Colossians 3, 15. Okay, any other questions? How do you know? I didn't hear that. Maybe you can type it in. How do you um, know the spirit? How do we know? Can we can we type that? Uh, okay. Somebody's hand is raised. It says you said how do we know what? How you grieve? How do you know when you grieve the Holy Spirit? How do you know when you grieve the Holy Spirit? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so when you get saved, and you especially when, when you get saved, the Bible says that um, we receive the Spirit of Christ. Okay, so one of the ways you can know you grieve the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. Okay, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. And so you're going to know that you've done that. And it's going to, that scripture will continue coming and it's going to say what you did was wrong. Okay, um, and also based on the scriptures. Okay, so even sometimes you, you may not even have known something was wrong, but you did it, and then you lose peace. That's another way. We're talking about the peace of God. You're, 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 you're just inside of you, you're unsettled. Just, and then something, the Spirit of God will be speaking to your heart. You, you may not hear his voice, but it's just you just know that what you, the way you spoke to that person was not nice. You see? 
Yes, that's what you want to say, guilt, your conscience. Sometimes he works through your conscience. You know what I mean? And that's why it's important to know the word of God. Okay? It's important to know the word. Because if you know the word, that will also protect you from the enemy enemy's accusation. See what I'm saying? Okay. Yes. You can come out of your house and uh, maybe there's a there's a roach running and then you step on it and the enemy will say, hey, the way you stepped on that roach was wicked. Repent. You know what I mean? That's accusation. You know what I mean? You should be able, but the word of God, you know, if you know the word of God, the word of God will guide you and you'll be able to know. Uh, the difference between the spirit of God is convicting you because it's often based on the scriptures and when the enemy is just trying to make you feel guilty. You see. I remember a pastor saying that he, he, he had fasted for for three days and finally he sat on the dining table you know and uh he brought him food to eat okay and so you know he kept his bible aside and he said a voice came to him saying hi there you go. very very carnal how can you be eating when the bible is next to your food that's not the way god works see what i'm saying so he knew that that was not the voice of god that was that was the voice of the accuser you see so when you study more and more of the word you'll be able to know the difference between the accusation of the enemy and the conviction of the spirit. The conviction of the spirit always wants to bring you closer to God. You see, why do you, why are you staying away? I, I love you. Come, I want you to pray more. I want you to grow spiritually. You know, uh, a lot of times the guilty, the, the when we talk about the guilt or the condemnation, I mean, use that language. The enemy tells you, oh, nobody loves you. You know, what you've done is so terrible. You're not even being church. You're not even a, you, you mean you're a preacher. You should stop preaching. You see, that's not the way. Spirit convicts. So conviction and condemnation are not the same thing. So the spirit will convict, will say, what you did is wrong, you can do better. You said, my child, rise up, you can do better. My child, rise up. That's the spirit speaks. The enemy says, oh, you know, you're not qualified again. Don't come to church. You know, just stay at home. We want to drive you further and further away from restoration. But most importantly, you have to know the word of God. That will help you as you grow spiritually. You'll be able to tell. When the spirit is grieved, of course, a lot of times you're not going to have in a sense, that your peace is going to be taken. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? raising a hand. I think there yes. two more. Um, all right. So I just want to um, good night, everyone. Just want to piggyback a little bit when you were speaking about um, what fellowship means, and um, when you would have given us contribution and participation. Um, yeah. I know it's it, it's close, um, but how do you distinguish between the two? Between really? What? Contribution and participation. So in contribution, you are you are you are you are supplying something. Okay. For instance, um you come to church that morning and you have a word of prophet prophecy. That's a contribution. You see, participation is just being part of what God is doing. Okay? So they could kind of overlap. When we talk about the participation or partaking, you are, you are part and parcel of what, what God is doing. Okay? So you are receiving and you're also giving the participation. Mm, okay. All right. Thank you. There's a question here. It says, said, we should not blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Is there any form of repentance for that? The Bible tells us there's no repentance for blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And the reason is that most people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit have actually, they're not even seeking it. They've turned away. You see. If basically they've rejected the things of God and they've called all this thing, this is this is all fake. You know, this is not God is not in all this. A lot of times there's no repentance. Okay, and that's why I tell you most people who who, who blaspheme the Holy Spirit are not even words. They have ever blasphemed. They've walked away from God. They've like, you know, the hell with all this. They don't want to have anything to do with God. That person is blasphemed. And a lot of times, for someone to blaspheme the spirit, and now I'm speaking within the context of where Jesus used it, that person is knowledgeable. You see. So those Pharisees, the Bible tells us they had the they, they, they had the covenant, they had the laws of Moses. They they knew the truth actually, and they refused. You see, for them, they knew that Jesus was resurrected, but they still went ahead and, and hired people to lie that it never happened. They saw miracles with their eyes. They went around and called it the devil. You know, they did everything. You see, so those people were well knowledgeable. So when someone blasphemes the spirit, it's not you know, it's not something that he just does because he doesn't know. They know the truth, and they fight against the truth. 
Okay, so if there are no other questions, we will. Any other questions? All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chima. Thank you, everyone. Um, he will continue the class next week, Tuesday. All right. So for this class, for tonight's class, for those of you who have registered, to, uh, registered in the class, you get the uh, uh, the pop, uh, the slides tomorrow morning along with the uh, quiz for tonight's class. All right. So as usual, try to complete them before next Tuesday class. All right. Pastor, I want to dismiss us in prayer. Okay. Let's pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. We pray that everything we've shared will not just be academic information, but will translate into life, will translate into ministry, will translate into impact. Thank you for all the, every student that has been listening. We pray, Father, Lord, that you help them walk in what they want and also become teachers of others. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good night, everyone. We'll see you night. next Tuesday. Good night. Bye-bye. Recording.